How does new data change your beliefs? The plot being animated right now illustrates one way you could go about answering this, using ideas of Bayesian updating that we're going to go over in this video. I'll explain exactly what's going on by the end, don't worry, but I thought you might like a taste for where this is going. We have a coin with some fixed but unknown probability of coming up heads, and this plot represents the belief of some agent for what that coin's true probability is, and it gets updated every time it sees a new flip. Maybe this goes without saying, but anytime you hear about coin flips discussed in probability, it's a generic stand-in for the many real-world situations where you have some kind of random event that can go one of two ways. As we play this out, the narrowness of the plot indicates being more and more sure, and the center concentrates around what the true underlying probability is for that coin. After seeing 100 flips, this model would give a 95% confidence to the true probability of flipping heads being between 0.65 and 0.82. In reality, the simulation here was using 0.72. More and more data tightens that confidence interval. In the last video, we looked at a different sort of example of this kind of thing, comparing different online sellers, where we had one seller with 200 reviews and a 93% positive rating, another with only 50 reviews and a 96% rating, and then another with a 100% review, but with 10 ratings. What we did was model buying experiences as random events that are either positive or negative, with sellers having some kind of constant but unknown probability of producing a good experience, what we were calling the success rate, or S. It's the same idea as the coin flips. How does the limited data that we see from random events inform our judgment about the true underlying probabilities at play. What we talked about last time was the probability of seeing some of this review data if you knew the success rate. And here, we're going to use Bayes' rule to turn that around, getting a sense for the probability of different success rates given the fixed data. One thing making this tricky is that there's an infinite continuum of possible values for what S equals. And if you want a distribution for the probability of S, based on the data, that probability has to somehow get divided among this uncountably infinite set of possibilities. We'll get to that in a moment, but to start the explanation, let's simplify and pretend that there's only 100 possible success rates, exactly 0%, 1%, 2%, and so on, up to 99%. Before you see any data, what do you think the probability for each one of these is? A natural place to begin might be to assign an equal probability to each one, in this case, splitting up as 1 100th for each. In Bayesian terms, this is known as our prior distribution. It represents the belief about the true success rate of a seller before we see any data. If you had pre-existing beliefs, you could bake those in by starting with a different prior. Our choice here of setting them equal is known as a uniform prior. To get the distribution after the data, what's known as the posterior, Bayes' rule instructs us to multiply this prior by the probability of seeing the data for a given success rate, where again, data here means something like seeing 48 positive reviews and two negative reviews, and then divide by the total probability of seeing that data. Here, let me walk through this, because there's actually a very visual way that you can read what this formula is doing. I like to think of this prior plot as representing many different parallel universes of all the possibilities, so, for example, every universe where the true value of S is 0.95 lives somewhere in this slice. But even if all these universes share the same value of S, you might see different data in each one of them, since reviews are a random process. So, once we see the bit of data, like 48 out of 50 positive reviews, we're restricted to only a small portion of these universes. So, in that slice we were just looking at, where the success rate is 0.95, we calculated last video that about 26% of the time, you would see 48 positive reviews like this. So all but 26% of this slice gets cut out. For most of the other slices, it's a much smaller proportion that would be consistent with the data. Essentially, none of the bars sitting lower than 80% are consistent with seeing 48 out of 50 positive reviews. So look back to the formula, where the prior is represented by the height of each of those bars. This next term, what's sometimes called the likelihood function, tells you what proportion of each one of these remains after seeing the data cuts out a lot of possibilities. Let me emphasize here, if the prior was something different, the shape of our shrunken space would also be different. 
Now, in this shrunken space, what's the probability of s being any particular value? Well, it's the size of the corresponding rectangle divided by the sum of all of them put together. All of them put together makes up the total probability of seeing the data. Another way you could think about this is that we rescale all of the values so that they add up to 1, and so form a valid probability distribution. And that is Bayes' rule. You take your space of possibilities, restrict it to the subportion that's consistent with your data, and rescale so that all the probabilities add up to 1. In reality, this unknown value s can be any real number between 0 and 1. But if we want to assign a probability to each one of those uncountably infinitely many values, there's a strong potential for paradox if you're not careful. Think about it. What's the probability that the true success rate is precisely 95% and not, say, 94.9999999%? If every single specific value within some range has a non-zero probability assigned to it, then the total probability is going to blow up to infinity. But if we set all of them equal to zero, then the total sum is zero, when in reality it should add up to one. After all, the probability that something will happen is one. So if they can't be non-zero and they can't be zero, what do you do? The key is to not focus on individual values, but ranges of values. For example, you might make these buckets to represent the probability that s lies between two values, like between 0.8 and 0.85. Also, rather than thinking of the height of each of these bars as representing the corresponding probability, think of the area of each bar as representing that probability. That might seem insignificant, but it's important. This way, if you consider finer and finer buckets, the smaller probability of falling into any one of them is accounted for in the thinner width while the height of the bars stays roughly the same. The reason that's important is that as you take this to the limit, cutting up more and more finely, you approach a certain smooth curve. So even though all the individual probabilities of falling into any one bucket approach zero, the overall shape of the distribution is preserved and even refined as we take this limit. Take note, the y-axis of the plot no longer represents probability. Since probability lives in the area of these bars, or width times height, the height represents a kind of probability per unit in the x direction, what's known in the business as a probability density. The other thing to keep in mind is that the total area here must equal one if it's gonna represent a valid probability distribution. Probability densities come to feel almost run of the mill when you're doing probability, but it's actually really clever when you step back to appreciate it. As you take things to the limit, even if there's paradoxes associated with assigning a probability to each one of the specific values, there's no problem if we assign a probability density to each one of them, giving what's known as a probability density function, or PDF for short. The way you interpret a PDF like this is that the probability that S sits between two values equals the area under the curve between those two values. So what's the probability of any one specific value? Well, the area of an infinitely thin slice is zero, so it's zero. What's the probability of all of them put together? Well, the area under the full curve is one, so it's one. You see, it sidesteps the paradox. As to Bayes' rule, it still looks identical to what we did before. You take your prior probability density function, you multiply it by the probability of seeing the data for a given value of s, and then divide it by the total probability of seeing the data, which is whatever constant it takes to make sure that the area under the curve is one. This gives us the posterior, the distribution representing your belief after seeing data. If you want, you could emphasize which one of these are probability density functions by using a lowercase letter. Now take a look back at the example we opened with, where you have a coin with some unknown probability, let's call it x, of coming up heads. And again, this is a generic stand-in for any real-world situation where you have a random event that can go one of two ways, but you don't know the underlying probability. Again, let's start with a uniform prior, meaning you have no pre-existing beliefs about the coin, or at least you don't want to bake those pre-existing beliefs into your model. If you see one flip and it's heads, let me ask you, how do you use Bayes' rule? Well, the probability of seeing this data for a given value of x is x by definition. So every value of this distribution is multiplied by x 
which shrinks the low values by quite a lot, but the high values by only a little. And then you renormalize. In this case, the normalizing constant would be 2, but let's just write it as C in general. If you then see a new data point, uh, tails, we now consider the function we just got as our prior, and we do a similar kind of update. This time, the probability of seeing the new data for a given value of x is 1 minus x. If x is the probability of flipping heads, 1 minus x is the probability of seeing that tails. So, you scale everything down by 1 minus x. And again, renormalize when you're done, meaning this constant will become something new. Now just wash, rinse, and repeat. Every head that you see adds another factor of x to our function. And every tails that you see adds another factor of 1 minus x. And there's always some normalizing constant sitting in front to make sure the total area is 1. If you prefer, instead of thinking of making many little updates one by one for each coin, you could also think of looking at all of the data at once, where the probability of seeing that data for a given value of x comes from the binomial distribution that we talked about last video. Either way, you get the same expression, some constant times x raised to the number of heads times 1 minus x raised to the number of tails. As more data comes in, this probability density function clumps up closer and closer around the true value. These distributions you're looking at are all examples of what's known as a beta distribution. To dig into that distribution and how we can use it to analyze some data, for example, choosing the best online seller, I'll see you in part three.